haunting visions of menace and mastery. From black and white to atomic green and blood red. There's a very simple effect that horror filmmakers are after. It is the... <sighs> Next, TCM invites you to a night at the movies, The Horrors of Stephen King, an all-new documentary celebrating the greatest horrors ever committed to screen with master storyteller Stephen King. Just talking about it, I break out in goosebumps. The most terrifying cinematic creations crafted with vicious artistry. There are scenes of excruciating suspense and terror as something pounds on the door outside. Don't miss A Night at the Movies, The Horrors of Stephen King, premiering next on Turner Classic Movies, kicking off a month of horror classics every Monday night in October. For a full schedule, visit TCM.com. Hi, I'm Peter Travers, film critic for Rolling Stone, and for the next several days, guest host for the vacationing Robert Osborne, which means I get the pleasure of kicking off TCM's annual salute to the genre that was tailor-made for the month of October, horror films. Every Monday in primetime this month, TCM will show some of the all-time great horror movies, culminating with a 24-hour marathon of classic fright films on Halloween. And to kick everything off right now, we have the world premiere of a new TCM original documentary. It's the latest installment in TCM's ongoing Night at the Movie series, documentaries which focus solely on one film genre. So far, TCM has looked at the genre of epics and suspense thrillers, and with this installment, horror is added to the mix. The documentary is called A Night at the Movies, The Horrors of Stephen King, and as the title implies, it's the best-selling horror author who gives us his personal take on the genre, which has served him so well over the years. In the next hour, you'll learn why King has such an affinity for the horror genre, and he'll go into detail about some of his all-time favorite fright films, including the surprising movie, which first scared him. King will also go in depth about all the major movie monsters, vampires, zombies, and ghosts, and he'll also discuss film adaptations of his books, some of which he liked and some of which he decidedly did not. So have a look. Produced, written, and directed by Laurent Bouzereau, here's the world premiere of the TCM original production, A Night at the Movies, The Horrors of Stephen King. One of the things that's always attracted me to the horror genre is that it's assaultive. The horror genre is not trying to make you think, at least not during the experience. I think that when I go to see a good horror movie, I'm just experiencing, I'm all about the experience. Or when I'm writing a story that I want to scare readers, I'm all about that experience. But I think that if it's really good, there should be something to think about later on. But what I was really attracted to from the very beginning, from childhood about the genre, is that it's a way of reaching out to the reader or to the viewer and saying, I'm gonna take you by the lapels and you're gonna forget that you were supposed to pick up the kids from their scouts meeting or their music lessons and you're gonna forget about making supper when your husband comes home uh, you're going to say, sorry, honey, it's going to be takeout tonight because I spent the afternoon watching The Dead Zone on TV and I was just totally enwrapped by that. And that's, to me, what the genre is supposed to do. It's what it's supposed to be about. Is it's supposed to assault your emotions and sort of overwhelm your reason and your logic. So when you see a car running by itself with nobody behind the wheel, in a movie that is based in so-called reality, that shot would immediately be out of the picture because you'd say nobody will believe that, but in the context of a horror movie, you do.
people say to me, what was the first movie that ever scared you? The answer is Bambi, uh, the Walt Disney picture. My mother took me to see Bambi in a, in a theater, and uh, uh, I remember the forest fire and the animals leaping to get away from the fire and being absolutely terrified and coming back and worrying that the house might catch on fire. That's the effect that the Unreal has, particularly for a child, that carry it into real life. You wonder uh, what's under the bed. And then I saw Earth versus the Flying Saucers in October of 1957. I was probably 10 years old, and the special effects were by Ray Harryhausen. And none of us had seen anything quite so sophisticated. And if you're a child, you believe. And when I watched the film, it was a Saturday matinee, and in the middle of it, the picture stopped. And the lights came up, and we all looked around at each other, and the theater manager came out and said, uh, we've just heard on the radio that the Russians have put Sputnik into orbit and over the United States of America. It passed over America every 90 minutes. And we all understood what that meant, that we were all gonna die, you know? So that is a real case where the art of the unreal and the fact of the real came together. On a very basic level, I was scared to death at the time in the movie theater. And then later on, I would think to myself, hmm, that's a really strong emotional reaction. I wonder if I could cause that to happen with my own work. So uh, my immediate response was to go out and, and write a story called The Invasion of the Star Monsters, where these creatures came down to Earth and laid waste. But uh, Earth versus the Flying Saucers is basically a science fiction movie, but these things do overlap, and the creatures wore these featureless, all-over metal suits. And when they took off the helmets, uh, underneath there were these awful, twisted, degenerated creatures that immediately started to melt away uh, as soon as the air hit them. And that was the horror aspect of it, where again, you know, th there's a very simple effect that horror filmmakers are after. And it is the, <clears throat> the gasp, the turning away. So that's the reaction that a filmmaker is looking for in a horror movie. But uh, the horror genre is an extremely delicate thing. And you can talk to filmmakers and even psychologists who studied the genre don't understand what works, what doesn't work, and more importantly, they don't understand why it works, when it works. Does it go back to childhood? Are there certain archetypes? It's tempting to say so, and certainly we know that children are afraid of the dark, and one of the elements that works a lot in horror fiction is that fear of the dark. And when you watch movies from the black and white era, and I'm thinking particularly of the era when Val Luton worked, you come to an appreciation of how wonderful black and white movies were. The, the use of shadow, the use of a kind of surreal imagery, like the scene in the swimming pool in Cat People, it's an extremely scary sequence where you never see anything. There's also that sense of surrealism that you get with some of the set photography in movies like Nosferatu or The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is still a very scary film. And I remember the first time that I looked at The Cabinet of Caligari, for instance, and thought to myself, whoa, this is really interesting. This has got a very surreal look. I can remember the first time that I saw Todd Browning's film, Freaks. I was very anxious to see it, but it never played on TV because it had the reputation of something that was beyond the pale, that just went too far. And for any horror movie fan, when you hear a critic or when you uh, read a film historian saying, this picture just went too far, you want to see it. Gooba gobble, gooba gobble. We accept her, we accept her. Gooba gobble, gooba gobble. I said to myself, there's no faking going on here women with beards and uh, dwarves and uh, 
guys that have no arms or legs to speak of, you're absolutely riveted to your seat and horrified by what you're seeing. And it has that effect that the best horror movies have of putting you in a position where you'd like to turn away and you can't. I would say probably the first horror movie that I understood as a true horror movie was made by uh, Francis Ford Coppola, and it was called Dementia 13. <laughs> it's a black and white movie, and it is an absolutely terrifying movie about an ax murderer. So that one terrified me as a kid because of the ax murders. And then a few years later, George Romero comes along with Night of the Living Dead. I knew nothing about the picture. I was in college at that point. And I went into the city of Bangor, which was about eight miles from uh, where I was living on campus, on a Thursday afternoon. The theater was empty, except for me and two or three others. Big old movie palace from that period with the chandelier down and just a cavernous place. The perfect place to have the absolute wits scared right out of you. And uh, I had no idea what the movie was about except that it sounded like it was about zombies, but my experience with zombie movies had been things like Macumba Love and I Walked with a Zombie. They weren't terribly scary movies, so I w really wasn't expecting a whole lot, but I had the afternoon. And uh, the movie starts with a man and a woman in a graveyard putting flowers on their father's grave, and uh, the young man starts to tease his sister about how scared she always was to come there. They're coming to get you, Barbara. And there's this guy wandering around that looks like your basic wino. He's just shambling, sort of, but you don't think of him as a dead person. He doesn't look like a dead person in a standard horror movie. He just looks like a guy in a kind of baggy suit until the shambler comes over and dashes this young man's brains out against a gravestone. And at that point, you say to yourself, I'm in a different world. This is just jump into a different uh, level of horror. As a sequence, it's genius. It's an evil, genius piece of work. You're just absolutely terrified. But I think that the shelf life of horror films is limited in terms of the emotional response of the viewer. The first time that you see Night of the Living Dead or Dementia 13, you're absolutely riveted. The second time, you're scared. The third time, the film has lost something essential that it had the first time. Now, people continue to go back and see The Night of the Living Dead, but what they're experiencing isn't horror at that point. It's the memory of the horror that they felt the first time that they saw it or the second time they saw it. But that's also one of the magic elements of the movies is that it not only causes us to experience emotions, it causes us to re-experience in them and then to remember where we were and how we felt. But you know, the thing about zombies that makes them so terrifying is they won't stop. Whether they shamble or whether they run really fast, the fact is, they won't stop. Uh, if you cut off an arm, you cut off a leg, they won't stop. The only thing that, that stops them is to shoot them in the head or, or burn them. So the horror comes from the fact that the nightmare never ends and death is not the end. I think that every good horror movie has a character where we can put our fears. It's the fear basket character, where we can say, I'm safe with this person. This is the person that I'm supposed to identify with. In Cujo, it's the mom uh, who's gonna try to protect the little boy. And it's Sheriff Brody in Jaws. There's no humanity in the shark. So when Brody finally is able to stuff an oxygen canister down its throat and blow it up, Nobody says, to his beauty killed the beast. Everybody just applauds because the nightmare has been slain.
greenhouse. I was working. I couldn't see. Yeah. Then, then a blast of cold air, and I heard Olsen scream. When I turned, the thing struck at me. In the thing, and in John Carpenter's remake, there's never any audience identification with that creature. We're totally with those people who are in that situation where they're isolated. It's a beautifully made piece of work. And when the thing finally starts to show up, we realize that it's totally divorced from humanity as we understand it. So it's perfectly okay to kill it. But with the pod people in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the terrifying thing is that the creatures have lost all their emotional abilities. There's no real sense at all of love, hate, uh, caring, there's no sense of humor, and they can take you over if you fall asleep. And uh, in that movie, Kevin McCarthy and Dana Winter, beautiful girl, as a child, I just absolutely fell in love with her, and I'm thinking, Kevin, you've got to save her. You can't let her go to sleep. And they fight so hard to stay awake. And uh, finally, Kevin McCarthy goes out of this cave where they're hiding, and uh, he leaves her. And when he comes back, she opens her eyes, and we understand that she's no longer the girl that he fell in love with. He's no longer Becky. And it's such a feeling of horror when we realize that she has become one of them. But you have to remember that most horror movies have some sort of a subtext. They have something there that makes them work because we're able to make a connection to real, actual life. And th the subtext of that movie uh, is very, very clear, talking about how people can give up their individuality, their sense of self, their sense of right and wrong, their morality, and become part of this marching horde of creatures. And it was easy at that time to say that uh, what was going on in that picture was a reaction to McCarthyism, to the sort of blind hatred and fear uh, that McCarthyism summed up in some people. But I suspect that the, the filmmaker, Don Siegel, I think that what he might have been thinking about was Nazism at that time, the way that that took hold and took over the, the German people. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. There have been varying takes on Frankenstein. In the original, the, the black and white Frankenstein, we feel some real pity for the monster. We understand that he didn't create himself. He was made out of parts, and he is actually trying to understand the world that he lives in. That's one take on Frankenstein, but the Hammer people decided that they wanted to do their own version of Frankenstein and Dracula and all these things. Well, Universal Pictures had copyrighted the makeup, so they couldn't do the bolt through the neck with the square head that Boris Karloff made famous. Instead, uh, they did something that was probably even more terrible to my mind and created this misshapen, uh, scarred creature who kind of hunched along. And there doesn't seem to be very much good in that creature, and nor does it seem to be uh, much good in uh, Dr. Frankenstein. You promised to destroy it, Victor. When I've carried out my research. But don't you see you've created a monster? That doesn't matter. So it matters which viewpoint you see the monster from, and the viewpoint is always the director's viewpoint. Part of the reason it worked was because the creature from the Black Lagoon was in 3D, and that led a, a dimension of reality. Again, it was something that we hadn't seen before, and it was something new. I don't know what you'd call it. It sounds incredible, but it appeared to be human. You knew that it had to be a guy, even if you were five, six, seven years old. You knew it had to be a guy in a rubber suit. And yet, when he grabs the girl and takes her under, uh, there's this sense that He's just the most horrible, terrible creature there is. At that point, you say to yourself, it really is the creature from the Black Lagoon. 
Even a man who is pure in heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf bane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. I never cared for the werewolf movies very much at all. Um, I agree that the idea is that there's a beast in all of us that can come out under certain circumstances, and I think we all understand that. But for me, the transformation, the literal transformation from a man into a wolf, it was too literal for me. All right, this has always been a low rent genre. There's no doubt about that, but I still have a, a big affection for uh, the monster pictures, the B pictures from the 50s and 60s. A lot of them were uh, Samuel Arkoff specials, uh, Roger Corman deals, American International pictures, where a lot of times they would simply start with a title. Someone would say, well, we're trying to get the teenage audience here. How about I was a teenage werewolf. So it's a ridiculous title, but they go out and they make the movie, very low budget, Michael Landon, starring as this uh, angst-ridden kind of guy. There are actually, <laughs> there are echoes of the Twilight books in that movie, I was a teenage werewolf, because really when you start to think of it, what is Twilight? It's I was a teenage vampire. <laughs> so, you know, everything comes around and goes around. And then you've got a lot of movies in the 50s where nuclear science caused some gigantic effect so that in them it's gigantic ants. Tarantula, it's a gigantic tarantula. The reason that we're afraid is because we have this understanding that the nuclear weapons are out there, uh, they cause death and terrible suffering. So this becomes lodged in the subconscious and when you say, as a filmmaker, these things are scary to me, therefore let's put it in a movie and it will be scary to somebody else. I am William Castle, the director of the motion picture you're about to see. At any time you are conscious of a tingling sensation, you may obtain immediate relief by screaming. William Castle was the great huckster of horror movies in the uh, late 50s and the early 60s. He had everything going. I mean, he made a picture called The Tingler, where at one point the film just stops, and Vincent Price says, Ladies and gentlemen, please do not panic, but scream, scream for your lives. And then if the theater owner did what he was supposed to do, uh, there was a kind of a, <laughs> there was a kind of a joy buzzer under a few seats, so that the seat would actually go kind of rah, like that, and that was the tingler. There was uh, a macabre, where you could take out an insurance policy, and if you died during, because you were so scared in this movie, which isn't scary at all, so it was a pretty safe bet. He had a lot of gimmicks going on, and he was into the idea of we're gonna make our money back in two weeks because after that, word will get around that this thing is a total stinker. But you have to remember, too, that Castle was behind Rosemary's Baby, so he was not incapable of making a good movie. Say a word, say another word. Don't let it know you're in my room. Now, we could argue back and forth about The Haunting. The Haunting is a very interesting picture. Is it a horror picture? I don't think it really is. There are scenes of excruciating suspense and terror in that movie. Uh, there's a scene where two women are in bed together, clutching each other in horror as something pounds on the door outside. <laughs> But it's not a ghost, it's not a monster, it's just a, a woman who's terrified herself and happened to get lost. But I would say, if anybody gives us a run for our money in the horror genre, it would be the Japanese. Uh, they did a lot of uh, monster movies in the 60s and in the 1990s and the early part of the 21st century. They started to do a lot of movies that combined somehow ghosts with technology. One of the big ones was Ring, 
uh, which deals with a cursed videotape that if you watched it, and that was a movie that actually had a buzz, a little bit like The Exorcist, the idea that uh, you have to be really brave to look at this movie because it's really scary. And it was, and it was very surreal, interesting movie. And actually, the American remake of The Ring was interesting too. But the ghost story movie that scared me the most was The Changeling with George C. Scott. He moves into this house that's haunted and it has some terrific, terrific scary imagery in it that sometimes overlooked, but it's a, a wonderful piece of work. I love the Amityville Horror. It's like the, the first of these over-the-top haunted house things. I mean, a lot of my problem with the, the movie came from the book, which was obviously such a piece of hokum, but haunted house stories are always stories about a house with a history, and part of the buildup in this kind of movie is the history of the house and all the terrible things that have happened there, and then they start to replicate and they start to happen again. I think an elemental fear that we have about houses where terrible events have taken place, whether it's murder or suicide, uh, it's a proven fact that a lot of times realtors have trouble moving property like that because people are afraid uh, the spirits of the dead will linger or that there'll be a, a psychic uh, afterburn of the emotions that people felt there. So in that sense, there's a nice little nugget at the base of the Amityville Horror. But what I really liked about the Amityville Horror movie was James Brolin's arc from this really nice guy who had bought a fixer-upper into this sort of purple-eyed guy that might snap at any moment and do anything. Uh, it was a terrific performance, and you really believed that at any moment, you know, he was going to take an axe to his family. Well, for me, the really scary uh, vampires were in the horror comics from the 50s. Um, I was never particularly frightened by Bela Lugosi. Uh, to me, he looked like some kind of a whacked out concert pianist in his tuxedo with his black hair swept back from his white forehead. And he says, I never drink wine. <laughs> he just kind of. <laughs> it's not scary. I mean, that's the, the whole thing about the movies maybe not traveling so well. It was only probably 20 years between the time when that movie was made and when I first saw it on late night TV, but it absolutely did not frighten me. But on the other hand, Christopher Lee was much more sinister, uh, much more magnetic uh, as Dracula. But also, that may be a generational shift. You have to remember that uh, Bela Lugosi scared uh, moviegoers as Dracula in the 1930s, and Christopher Lee comes along 20 years later, and there's an entire new generation that's ready for a, a new take, a color take on the vampire legend, complete with uh, blood and low-cut gowns that was also part of the attraction there. But I never really got behind the idea of the vampire as a suave, uh, love object, but I did understand sort of the uh, the attraction of vampirism, particularly for teenage boys. Um, you get to stay up all night, for one thing. You get to sleep all day, and you get all the pretty girls and because they're just totally fascinated by you. And uh, the whole act of sucking blood from the neck um, is a kind of symbolic sex act. And uh, certainly Bram Stoker, when he wrote Dracula and kicked this whole thing off at the end of the 19th century, uh, understood that. Uh, Dracula is a panting engine of sexuality. But my idea of the vampire was um, more when Toby Hooper made Salem's Lot for TV. He used uh, the character actor uh, Reginald Nalder as Barlow the Vampire. Uh, James Mason was the suave Igor figure in that uh, Straker. But Reggie Nalder came by his terrible looks in a perfectly normal way, if you want to call it that. He was burned in a house fire. So that he had a real, almost like a golem melted look. And uh, to me, that's the basis of the vampire 
as I've known and loved him, which is a figure of horror, uh, something that's, that's repulsive, um, who may take the guise of a young and handsome um, man, uh, but is really old and twisted and evil. But it's interesting to see how the vampire myth has been bent and shaped by various filmmakers. Take I Am Legend by Richard Matheson. It was made into a Vincent Price movie that's called The Last Man on Earth, which is a really interesting, moody, atmospheric piece of work. Uh, and then uh, Charlton Heston comes along, and uh, then it was made into a Will Smith version that came along later. If I could just find the nest, find out where they hold up. It's that situation that's almost like the reverse of Dracula. In Dracula, the vampire is alone and uh, the good guys are ranged against him. But in these films, we've turned it around so that the vampires are the winners. And uh, you have one guy, and uh, there are some very exciting possibilities inherent in that. There's also a real imaginative thrill to seeing a world where you can identify with the one human, and uh, there are monsters all around you, and you have to battle to retain your basic humanity. And then there's another vampire film which has another take on the vampire legend, and that's Near Dark by Catherine Bigelow, where the vampires are presented as nomads, outlaws that are traveling across the country. And it's a little bit crazy. It's a little bit Sam Peckinpah, but it's very much its own thing. And uh, it's a terrific, piece of work by Catherine Bigelow, who went on to make a number of other interesting films, ultimately becoming the first woman to win Best Director at the Oscars for Hurt Locker. Horror movies often work better when we have a stake in the game. The more we care about the characters, the more human they are to us, the more appealing they are to us, um, the more effective the horror tends to be, which is why Rosemary's Baby was such a smashing success, really. I mean, this was the period of her life where Mia Farrow cut off almost all of her hair so that she has a waif-like, childlike thing going on with her. She looks like she's maybe uh, 17, and a sickly 17 at that, and she's married to an aspiring actor played by John Cassavetes, one of his best roles. It was a part that he was almost born to play because he's got this sort of greasy smile and this queasy moral affect about him so that you begin to sense that he will do anything to become successful as an actor, and that includes uh, selling his child to devil worshipers. But the secret that the film is withholding from us is that they don't want to use the baby for sacrifice. The baby is the Antichrist itself, and that's a wonderful, horrifying ending. At the very end, the movie tops itself when Rosemary decides, no matter how horrible it may be, she is still the child's mother, and she comes on board with the uh, Satanists. But it works because we love Mia Farrow as Rosemary. It's a wonderful piece of work. Like Rosemary's Baby, The Omen is a fundamentally religious picture that trades for its effect on the idea that we believe in a war between good and evil, between God and the devil. I like the first Omen movie, but when we get to the sequels, we're sort of familiar with the pattern that they'll follow and it gets to a point where you say, okay, Damien, I get it, Devil's Son, trying to take over the universe, won't succeed this time, but there'll be another movie, and it just sort of uh, loses interest uh, for me. But one of the great horror films, one that really, really works, is The Exorcist, a novel by William Peter Blatty and the movie directed by William Friedkin. I'm Damien Cowes. And I'm that devil. Now kindly undo these straps. I remember when my wife and I were going to see The Exorcist, and we were going to go to a late afternoon show, and we decided that we would take a nap before the show, and we laid down, and neither one of us could sleep.
because we were thinking we're going to go see this picture and there had been all the stories in the paper about how awful it was and audiences were fainting and uh, people were running out of the theater and finally my wife Tabby sat up and said all right if we're going to do this let's go and to me she sounded like uh, a green paratrooper getting ready to jump out of the airplane for the first time because it had those expectations built up beforehand. Hey, my message here with this cash. Would you like to leave a message? I see that she gets it. When we finally saw The Exorcist, we actually did think it was a masterpiece. Uh, it wasn't just the story. It was the way that the story was told. There's a kind of tension to the cutting. And that story is told in a very tight, taut fashion. And as the movie goes on, Every time the priests walk up those stairs toward that room where that monster is, we feel a greater and greater sense of terror. That's terror. But when we're in the room and we see the decayed state of the little girl's body, that's a visceral reaction. And that's really the difference. You know, terror is something that lives in the, in the head, whereas the reaction that we have to horror is a more visceral reaction. So those are really very different things. There are some scenes that live in our memory and continue to work in a kind of classic fashion. And the one that everybody thinks about, I think, in, in that respect is the shower scene from Psycho. It's the granddaddy of slasher films. And the first time that you see that, you're just totally horrified by it. But I think sometimes there are horror movies. Texas Chainsaw Massacre would be one. Psycho would probably be one. Certainly The Exorcist would be one. Where these are real demon coasters. They're the big ones. They're the ones where mom and dad say, I'm not gonna go on that ride. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a picture where when you go in, uh, you have to be prepared for somebody who is going to try to seriously scare you out of your seat and make you look away from the screen. There's a van load of hippies that comes up to this house and uh, they fall afoul of this really terrible inbred family of meat cutters and the meat that they apparently like to cut are human beings. It's not a really gory movie. Um, a lot of it, like some of the Luton things, are done by suggestion, although the suggestions are a little bit more overt, like the meat hooks that hang down. Uh, Texas Chainsaw was the first movie, I think, to really effectively use those images of meat hooks and chains, which you see again and again in horror movies since then. And the fact that Leatherface is never really seen. He's just wearing this sort of awful organic mask and, and apron and swinging his chainsaw around. It's, it's an absolutely terrifying picture, and that was uh, Toby's genius in that. You lead up to a lot of things, but you never actually see it. But it's a terrifying movie, and I think for a lot of people, that was a movie where expectations were so dark uh, that people actually thought they saw more than they did. And in that sense, it's like the shower scene in Psycho. I can remember the first time that I saw Halloween. Most people can. They can remember the first time that you saw Jason in a Friday the 13th movie. You know, if you go back and look at A Nightmare on Elm Street, the first one, it's a work of genius. It's absolutely terrifying. The concept, the, the root concept is so simple and so elemental. The idea that your nightmares can follow you into the real world. It subverts everything that we know and everything that allows us to coexist with the whole idea of nightmares. You have this terrible dream, and then all of a sudden, you're coming awake and you say to yourself, oh, thank God, <laughs> that never really happened at all. But in the original Nightmare on Elm Street, Freddy is able to follow you into the real world so that literally the nightmare never ends. And that's a really terrifying concept. But you have to, at some point, get real uh, about this genre. And you can analyze it, and you can talk about what works and what doesn't. But at bottom, there is 
uh, a tendency in human beings to want to slow down and look at the accident. It's very human. It's part of the survival instinct to say, well, it happened to them. The worst happened to them, but I'm safe. I'm still okay. So that's one of the low cravings, if you will, that horror movies satisfy. We understand that there's a dividing line somewhere along the line, somewhere where you say to yourself, over here on this side is entertainment that's acceptable on some kind of moral ground. And then you move further into this gray area where you say, hmm, I don't know. And then you get over into the real hardcore exploitation and uh, torture porn. But uh, when you look at a movie like the original Friday the 13th, when the kids show up at the camp, um, there's this real feeling of we want to see them get away. We want to see them get out of this place. We're still rooting for the good guys, for our good guys, and we're not rooting for the monster. But by the time you get to Halloween 4 or Friday the 13th, number 9, you're saying to yourself, well, what we're going to do is we're going to see five or six really good-looking girls and five or six really good-looking guys. Uh, they're going to get naked, and then they're going to get shot in the head with a bow and arrow. And there's something about that that makes me morally queasy, where you say to yourself, we're not watching this movie anymore to see the monster destroyed. We're watching to see the monster destroy. That isn't to say that I haven't gone to some of those movies, but there's a moral queasiness there. And I think a lot of them are misogynistic, and uh, to a great degree, and we could point out various movies where that happens, uh, where women are just turned into absolute victims. But one of the things that's sort of interesting to me about a lot of the slasher genre movies is it's almost always a woman who triumphs over whether it's Freddy or whether it's Jason or whether it's Michael Myers in the Halloween pictures. Uh, you see this sort of wholesale slaughter, but at the end, it's the woman who's still standing. Uh, she's lost most of her clothes. She may be cut up. Uh, she may be uh, half crazy. Uh, her beautiful hair, always at the beginning, is nothing but these strings around her face. But she's still alive, and in a lot of the cases, she's able to dispatch the monster, at least until the next sequel. So in that sense, a lot of these pictures are saying, uh, if you want to view women as victims, you do so at your peril, because a strong woman will vanquish a monster. Carrie was a terrific piece of work, and there terrific acting by Piper Laurie. She was nominated for an Oscar, but did not win it. And Sissy Spacek was nominated and didn't win it. And both of them were really good. But I first saw the movie, this, this was when I was very young and very new at the business, and nobody would ever think of giving such a minor creature as the author a screening. So I had not seen Carrie, uh, and I had not read the screenplay. And I went to see it at a preview in Boston. My wife and I went. and. Uh, all we knew was that there was going to be an 8 o'clock screening of Carrie a week before the wide opening of the picture. What we didn't know was that the movie that it had been paired with at the theater was Red Fox in a picture called Norman, Is That You? It was an urban audience, and it was almost 100% black. There were very few white people in the audience. And my heart just sank because I thought to myself, this is not going to go well. This particular audience is probably not going to relate to this skinny little white girl in an upper middle class suburb with her menstrual problems. But they did. Uh, it's one of the most heartening examples in my mind of the way that art levels all walks of life, all cultures, all races. They cared, they identified with her, and uh, they cheered basically when she pulled down the gymnasium and. Uh, the whole place caught fire. But the genius of Brian De Palma was that he fooled us into taking our 
armor off just before the movie was over. We unarmored in our minds. We were already thinking about uh, where's my coat? Make sure that my wife gets her hat. Do you have money to pay the babysitter when we get home? So you're totally open and totally vulnerable to what happens. Now, at least I knew there was something. <laughs> the audience had no clue. So at the end of the movie, when Sue Snell, who was played by Amy Irving, is going to put flowers on Carrie White's grave, a hand comes up through the grave and seizes her, and the audience went to the roof, totally to the roof. And they screamed their head off, and it was just the most amazing reaction. And I thought, we have a monster hit on our hands, and Brian De Palma has done something new. Uh, he's actually created a shock ending um, that shocks an audience that was ready for a horror film. And uh, there were several people who did it after that. Uh, the original Friday the 13th had that same kind of ending where you think everything is going to be okay. There's a canoe on a plastic lake, and all at once, Jason leaps out of the water. And so uh, it became, after a while, part of the horror movie tradition to do that. Careful. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. I have a real problem with The Shining, and uh, Stanley Kubrick knew that I had a problem with The Shining. Uh, I had a discussion with him beforehand. Uh, he said, Stephen, Stanley Kubrick here. Don't you agree that all stories of ghosts are fundamentally optimistic? I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, if there are ghosts, it means we survive death. And that's fundamentally an optimistic view, isn't it? And I said, well, Mr. Kubrick, what about hell? And there was a long pause on the telephone line. And then he said in a very stiff and very different voice, I don't believe in hell. And I thought to myself, well, that's fine. But some of us do, and some of us believe that ghosts may survive and that may be hell and that was sort of where i was coming from with the shining but in the novel the shining uh jack torrance is a difficult character but he's fundamentally a, a sympathetic character and i always visualized him as a piece of metal that's bent first one way and the other by these malignant spirits who basically want his son because his son is a psychically powerful person so I saw these all as warm characters, characters that were being threatened by forces from without, from ghosts, from real supernatural creatures. And the film is extremely cold. Stanley Kubrick saw the haunting as coming from Jack Torrance, from the Jack Nicholson character, whereas I always saw it from outside. So we had a fundamental difference of opinion about it. I always thought, that the real difference between my take on it and Stanley Kubrick's take on it was this. In my novel, The Hotel Burns. In Kubrick's movie, The Hotel Freezes. It's a difference between warmth and cold. But the images are striking. There's no doubt about it. I mean, Jack Nicholson's face in the doorway, his bearded, crazy, grinning face. He says, here's Johnny which was his ad lib, and it became, you know, part of the movie. So the images are striking, but to me that's surface, it's not substance. So I used to describe The Shining, the film, as something like a beautiful car that had no engine in it. George Romero and I became friends because I happened to be in Pittsburgh, and he sought me out and asked if I'd like to do a little bit part in Night Riders, uh, which was one of Ed Harris's early movies. And I said, sure, I'll do that for you. And he must have seen something there because when we got together with Creep Show, where there are like five stories in Creep Show, and we actually had some pretty terrific people, we had an all star cast. And he said, I would like you to play Jordy Verrill. So I was very flattered. And Jordy Verrill is a story of a country guy who's not very bright, and uh, a meteor lands in his back pasture. And so he picks it up, and it breaks open, and he gets the stuff inside on his hands. And he starts to grow. He becomes a weed. And uh, 
I thought that it would be okay because it was a role I was familiar with. I had actually sort of been a Geordie Verrill type as a kid, kind of a country bumpkin. And also I figured the makeup would forgive a lot. You can see that I'm the guy who ought to have stopped acting at the level of community theater. But I've been asked several times to do cameos in various movies, and I've done it whenever it was possible for me to get to where the shoot was. And I think people kind of like it. It's kind of a Where's Waldo kind of thing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and comfort you and lift you up and give you peace. The Dead Zone, based on my novel, is Christopher Walken's finest dramatic role, I think. He did a terrific job as Johnny Smith, and he really conveyed the pathos of being the outsider, of being different, and being able to say, I don't want to be this way. This is not my fault. But The Dead Zone is a very atypical Cronenberg picture in a lot of ways. Um, there's nothing particularly bizarre about it, uh, and it has a warmth that's missing in a lot of the other pictures because Cronenberg is a very cold director with a very cold eye, but Dead Zone is a very warm picture. It has a really interesting, almost Saturday evening post-cover, mid-American look to it. And Cronenberg is really the best director of horror films in modern times, it seems to me. He's the one who thinks the most about what he's doing, and he's done a lot of very interesting stuff, like Scanners and Videodrome with James Woods. And uh, I was absolutely floored by The Fly. I didn't realize it was gonna be as grim as it was, but it was a terrific experience. But you know, horror movies don't get any respect. We're, we're poor relations at the table. We sit at the foot of the table, and uh, we don't get a lot of respect when the movies work. In fact, the only actor or actress that won a major award for anything that was based on my work was Kathy Bates for Misery. And she certainly richly deserved that Oscar, but when you look at a movie like Cujo, Dee Wallace in that movie gave the best performance that I've ever seen in one of my movies. And Dee Wallace probably deserved to be nominated as much, if not more, than Kathy Bates. And it's a performance that grows in my eye every time that I see it. When the horror, the splatter stuff started to show up, things start to change a little bit, and you get these movies that are extremely bloody, but we've all gotten wise to the effects, the blood bags, the face masks, all the things that work to create the illusion that people are being dismembered alive on the screen, so that a numbness sets in. But then a movie comes along that breaks the mold. <laughs> And I'm thinking about the Blair Witch Project, which was made for a very, very low, low budget and grossed mega millions of dollars. It isn't the sort of picture that any major studio would have greenlit. It's lo-fi, um, handheld camera stuff, but it works. <laughs> so these young people go in and they make a movie about people making a movie, a bunch of... Um, young kids, film students, who are going to go into the Blair Woods looking for this fabled Blair Witch. But it works because the kids get lost, and that's bad. That's something that strikes us, being lost in the woods. It's a very simple, easily grasped fear. And then they begin to see these weird symbols in the trees. And you realize there's something going on here that may well be supernatural. And the last image in the movie is the girl goes down, she's holding the camera, and we see this young man who is part of the film crew standing in the corner, just talking about it. I break out in goosebumps. And then something gets her and the camera falls to the ground. Uh, we see the image sideways, and that's the end of the movie. There's never any real explanation. 
And to my mind, that's where the real horror lies. I saw the Blair Witch Project uh, in 1999. I saw it on a screener originally. And about halfway through it, I turned it off because I was too afraid to go on. And Paranormal Activity is the same kind of movie and it works for the same reason. And one of the things that makes horror so attractive to young filmmakers, to people that are breaking into the genre, first of all, it strikes them as sort of an outlaw genre, and it is. But also, they're allowed, in a lot of cases, to do things that the major simply won't touch because they're unable to see any profit potential. Sometimes the profit comes when you're not trying to aim for the buck. But the horror movie and the Western are almost always there. But they do go through cycles, and I still believe that you see bulges in the amount of interest there is in horror films. And the more worried we are, the more horror movies show up. But as far as the future of the horror genre goes, it's impossible to say. Certainly, there have been technological innovations in Hollywood that have to do with special effects. They come with their own danger, and the primary danger is that all of a sudden you will have story supporting uh, special effects instead of special effects supporting story. Um, that's going to be a danger. 3D is going to be a danger because they're just simply uh, depending on that 3D thing that's coming out of the screen at you and it doesn't necessarily translate into goosebumps. The reason that I go to horror movies is not so I can think up new and innovative ways to slaughter women tied to tables or to uh, uh, call forth demons from the great unknown, but because it's a place to lay down my fears for a while and to indulge some of my darker emotions for 90 minutes or an hour and 45 minutes and then leave them in the theater. But uh, we all recognize that these films on some level appeal to what's the worst in us. And when we speak about the freak or when we speak about the other, we're talking about this really unlovely tendency in human beings to stone the outsider. The peasants come after Frankenstein with torches. And I don't know how many times we've seen Dracula stake, but the horror movie allows us to go in and to actually give free reign if you will, to a lot of our prejudices, which are all fear-driven. And that's what a horror movie dines out on. It is a fear-driven genre. And when we come out, maybe we're purged a little bit. That's the basic idea of catharsis. And that's one side of it. But if a movie has a supernatural side to it, it's a chance to exercise my imagination, to really give it wings and let it fly. And uh, that's the, the best part about writing stories and that's to me the best part about watching movies one of the great powers that movies have had from the beginning is to take us out of our own troubles but you know you go to a movie and you see something that's really terrible and it's awful to say but it's true you come out and say well my problems are nothing compared to uh, Jeff Goldblum I just saw him get turned into a human fly and that makes my life look a lot better and for a while this story, this act of the imagination, this sustained act of make-believe took me out of myself. It took me out of my own problems. So I think the horror genre will continue to be vital. It's uh, thriven in all the various decades of the American film. Other films come and go in uh, popularity, but horror films have always been a part of our culture. If I had to go to a desert island and I could bring a film with me, first of all, we'd have to assume there's a desert island with some power. Certainly, I would want to watch Casablanca. 
that's a film that I'd want to have. And I'd want to have Citizen Kane with me. But if for horror films, I know that I would want Psycho, and I would want to have The Exorcist, Dawn of the Dead, both versions, the Zack Snyder version and the George Romero version. Um, from my own work, I'd probably want The Dead Zone and Misery. Can I have three? I'd maybe want Cujo as well. Those are all pretty darn good movies. There are other movies made for my work that aren't horror movies that are good, like The Shawshank Redemption and, and uh, The Green Mile. But for horror movies, yeah, I think I'd want those. Now, if I had to take just one horror movie, boy, that's a question where all these movies flood in at once and say, pick me, pick me. But I guess I would probably pick the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Thank you.